The Tenth Sunday After Pentecost The Gospel of the Sunday According to Luke At that time Jesus said to some who trusted in themselves as just and despised others this parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee standing prayed thus with himself, O God, I give thee thanks that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, as also is this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes towards heaven, but struck his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I say to you, This man went down into his house justified rather than the other, because every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Words of the Gospel Exposition from the Catena Aurea And to some who trusted in themselves as just. Since faith is a gift given to the humble, not to the proud, he adds to what he had been saying a parable of humility and against pride. So we read, and to some, he spoke this parable. Since pride more than any other feeling disturbs the minds of men, the Lord more frequently warns us against it. Pride is contempt of God. For as often as a man ascribes the good he does, not to God but to himself, what is this but a denial of God? So because of those who trust in themselves, not attributing all to God, and for this reason also despising others, he puts this parable before us to show us that although a man draws near to God through justice, yet if he becomes proud, this will cast him down to hell. Hence we have two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee. The lesson taught us in the previous parable of the widow and the judge is that of perseverance in prayer. By means of the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, he teaches us how we are to direct our prayers to him so that our giving of ourselves to prayer may not be profitless. The Pharisee is condemned because he had prayed unwisely. For there follows, the Pharisee standing prayed thus with himself. By saying standing, he indicates a conceited soul, for even from his demeanor it could be seen that he was proud. He says he prayed with himself, not as it were with God, for his sin of pride turned him in upon himself. For there follows, I give thee thanks. He is not reproved for giving thanks to God, but because he revealed no desire that anything might be added to himself. So you are already complete. You abound in grace. There is no need for you to say, Forgive us our trespasses. What then are we to think of the one who resists grace, if he is so rebuked who gives thanks with pride? Let those take notice who say, God made me a man, I make myself just. O oh, worse and more detestable than the Pharisee, who proudly described himself as just, yet gave thanks to God for this. Take note of the order of the prayer of the Pharisee. First he recounts the things he was not, and then he tells us what he is. For he goes on, I am not as the rest of men. He should have at least said, as many men. What does the rest of men mean if not all others except himself? I, he says, am a just man. The rest of men are sinners. There are four forms in which every swelling of the arrogant is shown to us. When they think that the good in them is either from themselves, or if they believe it is given from above, think they received it because of their own merits, or certainly when they boast of having what they have not, or lastly, while holding others in contempt, they desire to appear as though they alone possess that which they have. Because of this, the Pharisee here attributes to himself alone the merits of his good works. Note that the proximity of the publican was an occasion of greater pride for the Pharisee, for he goes on, 
as also is this publican, as though to say, I am unique, he is of the rest. It was not enough for him to hold all human nature in contempt. He must also attack the publican. He would have sinned much less had he left the publican alone. Now in the one sentence he attacks the absent and wounds the only person present. We, we do not give thanks by speaking ill of others. When you give thanks to God, let him alone be your thought. Do not let your mind turn to men, and do not condemn your neighbor. The proud man differs from the reviler only in this manner. The one uses reproaches against others, the other uplifts himself because of the inconsiderateness of his own mind. Please go to side B. He who speaks ill of others does great harm to himself and to others. In the first place, he makes the one who hears him worse than he was. For if he is a sinner, he becomes more content, finding a companion in sin. If he is a just man, he is uplifted in himself. Because of other sins, he is led on to think more highly of himself. In the second place, he injures the fellowship of the church. For all who hear him will speak ill not only of the one who sinned, but will also impute calumnies to the Christian religion. Thirdly, he causes men to blaspheme the glory of God. For just as when we live justly, the name of God is honored, so when we live wickedly, the name of God is dishonored. Fourthly, he who is spoken ill of is shamed, and will become more hostile and reckless. Fifthly, he who speaks ill of others becomes liable to punishment for what he has said, which was also degrading to himself. It is profitable to us not alone to decline from evil, but also to do good. And so when he said, I am not as the adulterers, he adds, by way of contrast, I fast twice in a week, I give tithes of all I possess. They call the week the Sabbath, from the last day of rest. The Pharisees fasted on the second and fifth days of the week, Monday and Thursday. He therefore opposes fasting to the passion of adultery, for lust is born from bodily delights. He sets the payment of tithes against extortioners and unjust. For we read, I give tithes. So far do I shun extortion and injustice, that I also give away what is mine. See how through pride he laid open the citadel of his heart to the enemies that lay in wait for him, and whom he had shut out in vain by prayer and fasting. In vain are all the remaining defenses, as long as there is one place undefended where the enemy can enter. Examining his words, you find he asks nothing of God. He came up to pray. He has no wish to ask God for anything. He wishes simply to praise himself and insult the other man praying there. The conscience of the publican holds him afar off, but his piety brings him near to God. Though the publican is said to stand, he differed from the Pharisee both in word and in manner, and also in his contrite heart for he was ashamed to lift up his eyes to heaven, regarding them as unworthy of the celestial vision, because they had preferred to look upon earthly things and seek for them. And he also beat his breast, so we have, but struck his breast, as it were striking his heart because of its evil thoughts, and also as though awakening it from sleep. So he sought for nothing, only that God might be merciful to him, for there follows, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He had heard the remark that I am not as a publican, and he was not indignant, but rather moved to the heart. The one laid bare the wound, the other seeks a remedy. So therefore let no one put forward the poor excuse, I dare not, I am ashamed, I could not open my mouth. That kind of fear is from the devil. 
the devil wishes to close the approaches to God. What wonder, then, that God pardons what he confesses? He stood afar off, but he began to draw near to God, and the Lord began to draw near to him, for the Lord is high, and looketh on the low. And the publican would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven. He did not look up, that he might be looked upon. Conscience pressed him down, hope uplifted him. He struck his breast, he sought to punish himself, and for this the Lord had mercy on the repentant. You heard the prideful accuser, you heard the humble accuser. Now hear the judge speaking. I say to you, this man went down into his house justified. This present discourse puts before us two chariots, each with two charioteers. In one we have justice together with pride, in the other, sin and humility. Yet see how the chariot of sin passes that of justice, not by its own powers, but by the power of its associate humility. The other is defeated, not by any weakness of justice, but through the weight and swelling of pride. For as humility by its excellence overcame the handicap of sin, and leaping forward reaches God, so pride, by its mass, easily weighed down justice. If, therefore, you give yourself earnestly to many good works, but take yourself for granted, you have lost all the purpose of your prayer. But should your conscience be laden with a thousand bundles of guilt, but you believe this only of yourself, that you are the lowest of men, you will obtain much confidence in God's presence. And so he goes on to give the reason for this sentence, saying, Every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The name humility is manifold in meaning. Humility is a certain moral excellence, according to the words, A contrite and a humbled heart thou wilt not despise. There is a humility that comes from suffering, as we learn from the words, the enemy hath persecuted my soul, he hath brought down my life to the earth. There is the humility that comes from sin and from pride and from the unsatiability of riches. For what is baser than those who cast themselves down before riches and power and hold them as great things? It is possible also to be worthily uplifted, that is, when you do not dwell in thought on lowly things, but your mind is uplifted in virtue through greatness of soul. Such elevation of mind is conspicuous in affliction, or as a certain generous firmness in the midst of tribulations, a contempt for earthly things, a manner of life that belongs to heaven. And elevation of soul of this kind is seen to differ from the arrogance of pride, as the fullness of a healthy body differs from the inflation of the flesh in dropsy. This prideful inflation can cast down, even from heaven itself, whoever is not watchful, while humility can uplift even a guilty man from the depths. For the one saved the publican before the Pharisee, and led the thief into paradise before the apostles. The other penetrated even among the spiritual powers. And if humility alongside sin raced so fast that it passed justice joined to pride, if you yoked it to justice, how would it not go? With great confidence it will come to stand at the divine tribunal in the midst of the angels. And again, if pride joined to justice will was able to cast this latter down, were pride joined to sin, to what deep Gehenna will it not thrust it down? I do not say this that we may neglect justice, but that we may avoid pride. But someone may perhaps wonder why the Pharisee should be condemned for speaking a few words in praise of himself, while Job, who said many, is crowned with honor. For the reason that the Pharisee had said such things while for no reason condemning others, Job, on the other hand, though his friends urged him on and affliction pressed hard upon him, was compelled to speak of his own virtues for the glory of God lest men should cease from going forward in virtue. 
The Pharisee is a figure of the Jewish people who boasted of their merits deriving from the law. The publican, a figure of the Gentile, who though far from God confessed his sins, and of whom one goes away humbled because of his pride, the other because of his humble repentance merited to draw near exalted. St. Basil, Bishop and Doctor, on Humility O oh, that man had remained in glory with God! For he would then possess not the glory now imputed to him, but his own true glory, made great by the power of God, made luminous by the divine wisdom, made blessed by eternal life and its joys. But since he turned away from the desire of the divine glory, hoping for a greater, seeking eagerly for what he could not obtain, he lost what he should now possess. And now his sur surest salvation, the healing of his wound, his way of return to his beginning, is to be humble, not to think that he can ever of himself put on the cloak of glory, but that he must seek it from God. In this way he will put right the false step taken. In this way he may return to the holy obedience he rejected. But having overthrown man by the hope of false glory, the devil does not cease from tempting him with these very same delusions, devising countless snares for this purpose, proving to him that it is a great thing to amass riches, that by this means he may become great, and that he should be eager to obtain them, which in fact do not lead him to glory, but may rather lead him into great danger. For the amassing of riches is the beginning of avarice, and this amassing does not lead to any glory, rather it blinds men through folly, uplifts them to no purpose, and causes a sickness like an inflammation within the soul. A body that is swollen is neither healthy nor of use to any man, it is rather an unwholesome state, the beginning of danger for him, and a source of death. And this is what arrogance is to the soul. This swelling up of the mind does not arise from money alone. It is not only because of their wealth, because of the elegance and richness of their dress that men become proud, nor because of their elaborate table, going far beyond what is needed, nor their excessive personal adornment, their splendid houses, splendidly furnished, their servants, their retinue of flatterers, but also because of their public office men become uplifted above what is natural. If the people have entrusted some dignity to any of them, if they have been thought worthy of some post of honor, or some distinction has been conferred upon them, they imagine that through this they have risen above the ordinary nature of man. They think that they now sit alone among the clouds, that the rest of men are but dust beneath their feet, holding themselves as superior to those who gave them their present dignity. They are contemptuous of those through whom they receive their imagined glory. This shows how filled with folly they have become. For their glory is more fragile than a dream, their splendor more unsubstantial than a vision of the night, given them by the will of the people, and ended by the will of the people. A senseless individual of this kind was that son of Solomon, Rabom, young in years and still younger in mind, who when the people were eager for a milder king, threatened them with one who was harsher, and by this threat lost his kingdom, and where he had hoped to reign with a more arrogant rule was cut down from the dignity he already possessed. The strength of his hand, his speed of foot, the beauty of his body, had made him insolent, things that an illness would destroy and time consume. He did not remember that as all flesh is grass, and all the glory thereof as the flower of the field, the grass is withered, and the flower is fallen. Such was the arrogance of the giants of old because of their size and strength, such also was the empty pride of Goliath, who mocked at God. And such also was Adonis, who gloried in his beauty, and Absalom, who gloried in the beauty of his hair. Among the gifts given to men, the greatest and most enduring seem to be wisdom, 
and prudence, and these too have their vain uplifting and their imagined unreal glory. If they who have them have not also the wisdom of God, all their gifts amount to nothing. For the evil which the devil worked against man turned against himself. Without knowing it, what he contrived against man he contrived against himself. For not only did he injure him whom he had hoped to separate from God and from eternal life, but he betrayed himself, became an exile from God, and condemned to eternal death. The snare he laid for the Lord caught him instead. He was crucified on the cross, he planned to crucify him, and died the death by which he hoped the Lord would die. And if the prince of this world, the first, the greatest, the invisible master of human wisdom, is caught in his own artifices and brought down to utter ignominy, how much more will not his disciples and imitators be abased, no matter how clever they are, for protesting themselves to be wise, they became fools. Pharaoh used guile to destroy Israel, and was caught unawares in a disaster he had never expected. And the child, exposed to death at his order, was reared in secret in his own royal house, and after casting down the power of Egypt, would lead Israel to deliverance. And Abimlach, the murderer, the natural son of Gideon, who slew the seventy lawful sons, and thought he had wisely planned to secure a stable possession of the kingdom by slaying his accomplices also, was in turn crushed by them, and perished by a stone flung from the hand of a woman. And the Jews took counsel against the Lord, which was to be their own ruin, when they said, If we let him alone so, all will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. And after this plan of theirs, putting Christ to death, to as it were save their place and nation, by this very plan they came to disaster. For they were driven from their land, and cut off from their laws, and from their worship of God. And so in a thousand ways we may learn how frail is the quality of human wisdom, how petty and lowly, rather than sublime and great. Therefore, no truly prudent man will think himself great because of his own wisdom, or because of the other things I have spoken of, but will attend rather to the excellent counsel of the blessed Anna and the prophet Jeremiah. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the strong man glory in his strength, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But in what shall man glory, and in what is man great? Let him that glorieth glory in this, he said, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord. This is the grandeur of man, this his glory and greatness, truly to know him who is great, to cling to him, and to seek for the glory of the Lord of glory. For the apostle says to us, He that glorieth may glory in the Lord, where he declares, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and justice and sanctification and redemption, that as it was written, he that glorieth may glory in the Lord. This is complete and perfect glorying in God, when a man is uplifted, not because of his own justice, but because he knows he is empty of true glory, and made just only through his faith in Christ. In this Paul gloried, that he thought nothing of his own justice, that he sought that justice alone which comes through Christ, which is from God, justice in faith, and that he might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings, and be made like him in his death, if by any means he might himself attain to the resurrection which is from the dead. It is here that the whole top loftiness of arrogance falls down. Nothing is left to you in glory, in, O man, whose true glorying and whose hope is in mortifying yourself in all things, and in seeking for that future life in Christ, of which we have already a foretaste when we live wholly in the love and in the grace of God. And it is God who worketh in you both to will and to accomplish according to his good will. 
And God has made known to us his own wisdom through his Spirit for our glory. And in all our efforts it is God who gives us strength. I have labored more abundantly than all they, says Paul, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And God has delivered us from danger and beyond all human expectation. But we, he says, had in ourselves the answer of death, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raiseth the dead, who hath delivered and doth deliver us out of so great dangers, in whom we trust that he will yet also deliver us. Why then, I ask you, are you full of pride, because of what you have, when you ought rather to give thanks to the giver of what you have? What hast thou that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received it? You did not come to know God through your own excellence, but God looked upon you out of his own goodness. But after you have known God, or rather are known by God, you have not laid hold of Christ because of your virtue, but it is Christ who through his coming has laid hold of you. I follow after, he says, if I may by any means apprehend, wherein I am also apprehended by Christ Jesus. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And do you pride in this and make the mercy of God a pretext for arrogance? Recognize yourself for what you are. Another Adam cast forth from paradise. Another Saul abandoned by the Holy Spirit. Another Israel cut off from its holy root. Thou standest, he says, by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Judgment is in accord with grace, and as you have used what was given to you, so shall the judge judge you. And if you do not even understand this, that you have been given grace, or should you through great stupidity believe that the grace is really your own virtue, you will do no better than the blessed apostle Peter. For you cannot love the Lord more than he did who wished to die for him. But since he spoke out a very great conceit when he said, Although all shall be scandalized in thee, I will never be scandalized, he was delivered over to human cowardice and sank down to denial of him, so that from his own fall he might learn to be compassionate to the weak and acquire discretion and come to see clearly that just as he had been raised up by the hand of Christ when he was sinking in the sea, so when he was in danger of perishing in the storm of scandal, because of his own faithlessness, he was protected by the power of Christ, who also foretold to him what was to happen in these words. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and thou, being once converted, confirm thy brethren. And Peter, after he had been corrected in this way, was greatly helped, and taught to put away his earlier boastfulness, and so learn consideration for those who are weak. And that Pharisee, overbearing and swollen with pride in himself, not alone trusting in himself, but speaking ill of the publican, and this even in the presence of God, lost the glory of his uprightness because of the sin of his arrogance. And it was not he went down justified, but the publican, because the publican had given glory to God, the holy, and had not presumed even to lift up his eyes, but prayed humbly for pardon, accusing himself even by his demeanor, beating his breast, and seeking for nothing save mercy. Watch, therefore, be on your guard against grievous loss because of pride. This man forfeited his virtue because he was given over to pride. He lost his reward because he trusted in himself. He was placed lower than the sinful and the humble because he had exalted himself above him and had not waited for the judgment of God, but had himself pronounced judgment. Let you beware of lifting yourself above anyone, not even above those who are great sinners. For he who is guilty of many great sins oftentimes will be delivered from them through humility. So never let you hold yourself as more virtuous than another, 
for fear that declared just by your own sentence, you may be condemned by the sentence of God. Neither do I judge my own self, for I am not conscious to myself of anything. Yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Do you consider you have done some good action? Give thanks to God, and do not set yourself above your neighbor. Let everyone prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For what have you profited your neighbor when you confessed your faith, when you suffered exile for Christ's name, when you labored with fasting? The profit of your good work was not his, but yours. Beware lest you fall down like the devil, who raising himself against men was cast down by a man, and placed beneath the feet of the one he had trodden on. Such too was the calamity of Israel, for raging against the Gentiles as unclean, they became in very truth unclean themselves. While the Gentiles have become clean, their own justice has become like a menstruous rag, while the wickedness and impiety of the Gentiles was wiped out through faith. In brief, keep before you the proverb, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And keep at hand the words of the Lord, Every one that humbleth himself shall be exalted, and he that exalteth himself shall be humbled. Be not an unjust judge to yourself, and do not try yourself with favor. If you appear to have done something good, do not put that down in your favor, and consign your sins to oblivion, nor praise yourself for the good you did today, while pardoning yourself for your recent or past offenses. But should the present uplift you, recall the past, and the foolish swelling of your pride will come down. And should you see your neighbor's sin, beware of thinking only of his sin. Think also of the good he has done, and continues to do, and keeping everything in mind, not looking at one thing only, very often you will find that he is better than yourself. For God will not examine man with partiality. I come, he says, that I may gather together their works and their thoughts. Yet, when he rebuked Josephat for the sins he had committed, he remembered also the good he had done. But good works are found in thee. We should keep these and similar things before our minds as a safeguard against arrogance humbling ourselves that we may be exalted, mindful of the Lord who came down from heaven to our great lowliness, and was in turn raised up from lowliness to the sublimity that belonged to him. All that the Lord has done, we shall find, is intended to instruct us in humility. As a child he lay in a cave, and not in a bed, but in a manger. In the house of a carpenter and of a poor mother, he was obedient to his mother and to her spouse. While being taught, he listened, learning what he had no need to learn. He asked questions, and because of his wisdom, his questions instructed those who heard him. He humbled himself to John, that the Lord might be baptized by his servant. He resented no one who assailed him, nor did he use against them the ineffable power that was his, but yielded as to higher power, and yielded to temporal authority the power that belonged to it. He stood as a criminal before the high priests. He was led before a judge, and when he could have silenced his calumniators, he bore their accusations in silence. He was spat upon by the lowest servants and by slaves, and delivered over to be put to death, and to the most shameful death known to men. And it was in this way he passed his life from birth to death. And after these humiliations he manifested his glory, sharing his glory with those who were the companions of his lowliness. Of these, the first are the blessed disciples, who poor and naked traveled the world, not with the words of wisdom, not with a multitude of followers, but solitary wanderers, destitute, journeying over land and sea, scourged with whips, stoned, persecuted, and in the end put to death. These are the paternal divine lessons we have been taught, let us return to them, that through humility we may also come to eternal glory, the true and perfect gift of Christ. 
How are we to come to this saving humility, leaving behind us the deadly swelling of arrogance? By exercising ourselves in it in all things, and by keeping in mind that there is nothing which cannot be a danger to us. For the soul becomes like the things it gives itself to, and takes the character and appearance of what it does. Let your demeanor, your dress, your walking, your sitting down, the nature of your food, the quality of your bed, your house and what it contains, aim at simplicity. And let your speech, your singing, your manner with your neighbor, let these things also be more in accord with humility than with vanity. In your words let there be no empty pretense, in your singing no excessive sweetness, in conversation be not ponderous or overbearing. In everything refrain from seeking to appear important. Be a help to your friends, kind to the ones who live with you, gentle to your servant, patient with those who are troublesome, loving towards the lowly, comforting to those in trouble, visiting those in affliction, never despising anyone, gracious in friendship, cheerful in answering others, courteous, approachable to everyone, never speaking your own praises, nor getting others to speak them, never taking part in unbecoming conversation, and concealing where you may whatever gifts you possess. On the contrary, accuse yourself of your own faults, and do not wait for others to find fault with you, that you may be like the just man who in the beginning of his speech is his own accuser, that you may be like Job, who was not ashamed to confess his faults before the multitude in the city. Do not be heavy in rebuking, nor reproach another quickly or in heat, for this is a kind of arrogance, and do not find fault over little things, as though you yourself were wholly perfect. Give your help to those who have made a slip, helping them spiritually to restore themselves, as the Apostle warns us, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Be as eager not to be glorified among men, as others are to acquire glory among them, provided you remember the words of Christ that he loses his reward with God who looks to be honored before men, and does good that he may be seen by men. For, he says, I say to you, they have received their reward. So do not bring loss upon yourself seeking to be esteemed by men. Since God is a great watcher of men, seek glory from God, for he gives a splendid reward. Have you attained to dignity that men should stand about you and show you respect? Then become like those subject to you, not as having power, as the Scripture says, lording it over the clergy, and not after the manner of earthly rulers. For he who would be first, the Lord has commanded him to be the servant of all. In brief, then, follow after humility as a lover of it. Love it, and it will glorify you. If you wish to travel to the true glory, this is the way, with the angels and with God. And in the presence of the angels Christ will acknowledge you as his disciple, and he will give you glory if you have imitated his humility, who said, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. To whom be glory and empire for ever and ever. Amen. St. Augustine, Bishop and Doctor, The Source of Prayer Faith, the Fountain of Prayer The lesson of the Holy Gospel today strengthens us both to pray and to believe, and to place our trust not in ourselves, but in the Lord. What greater encouragement have we to pray than the parable put before us earlier of the unjust judge? For this unjust judge who was without fear of God or regard for man, heard the petition of the widow, who came to him, moved to this not by compassion, but because he was overcome by her importunity. And if he gave ear who so hated to be importuned, how will he not hear who exhorts us to ask of him? When the Lord has urged us, by this comparison with a contrary case, 
that we ought always to pray and not to faint. He added this also, But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth? If faith fails, prayer dies. For who will pray to him in whom he does not believe? Because of this the blessed apostle, when he exhorted us to pray, says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And to show us that faith is the source of prayer, that the river cannot run when the fountain head is dry, he added this, But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Therefore that we may pray, let us believe, and that the faith by which we pray may not fail, let us pray. Faith pours forth in prayer, and the prayer of faith poured forth obtains for us firmness in faith. Faith, I repeat, pours forth in prayer, and prayer poured forth obtains constancy for faith itself. And lest faith should fail in time of temptation, the Lord says to us, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Watch and pray, he says, lest ye enter into temptation. What does it mean to enter into temptation, if not to depart from faith? As faith retires, temptation advances. That your charity may come to see more clearly that the Lord said, Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. In regard to our faith, lest it weaken and die, he also said in the same place in the gospel, This night Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. He prays who watches, and should he not pray who is in danger? But when the Lord said, The Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth? He spoke of faith which is perfect, for this will scarce be found on earth. See how the church of God is full? And who would come there were it not for faith? Who would not move mountains if they had perfect faith? Consider even the apostles. Had they not great faith, they would not, leaving all things, rejecting this world's hopes, have followed him. And yet, had they had full faith, they would not have said to the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. And consider that other man, when he presented his son to the Lord, that he might deliver him from an evil spirit, note his faith, though it was not full faith, and who, when asked if he believed, said with tears, I do believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, he says, I believe, Lord. Therefore he had faith. But he added, help my unbelief. Therefore his faith was not perfect. Faith the gift of the humble, not of the proud. But because faith is given to the humble, not to the proud, he said to some who trusted in themselves as just and despised others, this parable, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee said, O God, I give thanks that I am not as the rest of men. He should at least have said, As are many other men. What does the rest of men mean if not everyone else but himself? I, he says, am the just man, all others are sinners. I am not as the rest of men, unjust, extortioners, adulterers. Do you see how the presence nearby of the publican is an occasion for greater pride? As he says, also is this publican. I, he says, am unique, he belongs to the rest. I, he says, am in nothing like this man, because of my just deeds, by which I am not an unjust man. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. But what did he ask of God? Search his words and you will find nothing. He went up to pray. He had no desire to ask God for anything. He wished to praise himself. And it was not enough not to ask God for anything, but only to praise himself. He wished also to insult the other man praying there. The publican standing afar off, and yet he began to draw near to God. The conscience of his heart held him afar off. His piety brought him close to God. But the Lord bent down to him from near at hand, for the Lord is on high, but he looketh on the lowly. But the high, as was this Pharisee, he knoweth afar off, but he does not forgive them. 
Learn further of the humility of the publican. It matters little that he stood afar off, nor that he would not so much as lift up his eyes towards heaven. He did not look up so that he might be looked upon. He did not dare to look up. Conscience pressed him down. Hope uplifted him. And learn yet more about him. He struck his breast. He exacted punishment of himself. And for this the Lord spared the sinner confessing his sin. He struck his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Hear how he prays. What wonder that God forgives him when he accuses himself in this manner. You have heard the case of the Pharisee and the publican. Now hear the sentence. You have heard the arrogant accuser. You have heard the accused, a humble man. Now hear the judge. Amen, I say to you. Truth is speaking. God is speaking. The judge is speaking. Amen, I say to you, this publican went down into his house justified rather than the Pharisee. Tell us, Lord, the grounds of this sentence. I see the publican goes down from the temple justified, not the Pharisee. But I want to know why. You want to know why. Hear why. Because every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You have heard the sentence, Beware of the evil grounds of it. I shall say this in another way. You have heard the sentence, Beware of pride. Now let them see, let them hear, and let learn these things, these irreverent talkers, whoever they are, who presume upon their own strength. Let them listen, who say, God made me a man. I myself make myself a just man. Oh, more perverse, more detestable than the Pharisee. The Pharisee did indeed call himself a just man, yet he gave thanks to God for this. He called himself a just man, but he gave thanks to God. O oh God, I give thee thanks that I am not as the rest of men. O oh God, I give thee thanks. He gave thanks to God that he was not as the rest of men, and yet he was rejected as proud and conceited, not because he gave thanks to God but because he did not wish, as it were, for anything more to be added to him. I give thee thanks that I am not as the rest of men unjust. You therefore are just, so you ask for nothing. So therefore you are perfect, so man's life on earth is not a warfare. You are complete, then? You abound already? There is no longer need for you to say, Forgive us our trespasses. If he is rebuked who gave thanks with such pride, what are we to say of one who impiously attacks God's grace? The baptism of Christ necessary to children. And after this case was finished and the sentence spoken, the little children then came to him, or rather were brought to him, and placed before him that he might touch them. By whom should they be touched if not by the physician? These, I take it, were healthy. To whom should children be brought to be touched? To whom? To the Savior. If it is to the Savior, then it is to save them. To whom then but to him who came to seek and to save that which was lost? Where had these been lost? As to themselves personally, I know they are innocent. I wish to know of their guilt. From where did it come? I learned from the Apostle. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into this world, by one man, he says, sin entered into the world, and by sin death, and so death passed upon all men in whom all have sinned. Therefore, let the children come, let them come to him, let the Lord be heard, suffer children to come to me. Let the little children come, let the sick come to the physician, let the lost come to the Redeemer. Let them come to him. Let no one prevent them. In the branch they had committed nothing, but in the root they had become lost. Please go to the next tape. Let the Lord bless both little and great. Let the physician touch both little and big. We commend the need of the little ones to their elders. Speak you for those who cannot speak, ask for those who cry. And if you are true elders to them, be also their protectors. 
protect those who cannot yet defend themselves. Their loss was a common loss. Let their finding be one with another. We are lost together. Let our finding be together in Christ. In merit we differ one from another, but grace is common to all. In them there is nothing of evil, save what they draw from the common source. They have no evil, save what they draw from their birth. Let those not hinder them from salvation, who have added so much to what they drew. He who is older in years is older also in sin. But the grace of God wipes away what you have drawn, and wipes away what you have added. For where sin abounded, grace has more abounded. Turning then to the Lord, let us beseech him for ourselves, and for all people who are with us in the courts of the house of the Lord, that he may deign to watch over them and protect them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Venerable Bede, Priest and Doctor, Explanation of the Gospel He said to some who trusted in themselves as just, As the Lord had concluded the preceding parable of the unjust judge, in which he taught us that we ought always to pray and not to faint, by saying that when the judge shall come, it is with difficulty that he will find faith on earth, lest anyone be satisfied with mere faith, or with mere knowledge, or even by a simple confession of faith, he presently shows us very carefully, by another parable linked to the first, that it is not our protestations of faith that will be considered by God, but our works. And among these works humility holds the chief place. It was for this reason that a little earlier, when he compared faith to the tiny grain of mustard seed, which is minute indeed, but ardent and burning when crushed, he added, concluding his discourse, the words, So you also, when you have done all these things that are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. In contrast to this are the proud, who, though they are far from doing all things that are commanded them, and do only a little of what is commanded, Nevertheless, not alone do they dare to pride themselves upon their justice, but they also despise others, and so when they pray they are not heard, since their faith is without works. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The publican, praying humbly, belongs to the members of the church, to the members of that widow spoken of in the preceding verses, of whom it was said there, and will not God revenge his elect who cry to him day and night? The Pharisee, throwing away his merits, belongs to those upon whom that terrible sentence was pronounced at the end of the previous parable. But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, think you, faith on earth? The Pharisee, standing, prayed thus with himself. The pride of arrogant men is disclosed to us in four ways. When they think the good within them comes from themselves, or if they believe it is given to them from above, they consider that they receive it because of their merits. And most certainly when they boast of having what they have not, and lastly, when despising others, they desire to appear as having in a unique way whatever it is they may have. The Pharisee here is seen to have fallen into his vice of boasting, and on this account he went down from the temple without righteousness, because he had placed himself above the publican who was praying there, and because he was, as it were, attributed the merits of his good works to himself alone. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I possess. Ezekiel the prophet describes for us the vision he had seen of the living creatures of heaven, and the whole body was full of eyes round about all four. The bodies of the living creatures are described as full of eyes, because the action of the just is carefully considered from every side, looking forward with desire to the blessings to come, sagaciously avoiding what is evil. But it will happen to us that while we are absorbed in certain things, we often neglect other things. And where we neglect there beyond any doubt, we are not paying attention. Here the Pharisee is so wholly taken up with giving thanks to God, with making known his abstinence, with giving an account of his alms deeds, that he has paid no attention to the safeguarding of humility. 
And what good is it if the whole city is carefully defended against the assaults of the enemy, if one way is left open by which they may enter? And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes towards heaven, but struck his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I say to you, this man went down into his house justified rather than the other. What hope of pardon have we not here for those who truly repent when a publican confesses and weeps over the guilty state of his own soul, and though he comes a sinner to the temple, he goes down from the temple justified? Mystically, however, the Pharisee stands for the Jewish people, which prided itself on its merits, which arose from the justifications of the law. The publican stands for the Gentile, who far from God confesses his sins. Of these, one because of pride goes away humbled, the other because of humble repentance, merited to draw near to God, exalted. Because every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And this may well be understood of either people spoken of, or of any proud person, or of any humble person, as those other words also, that we read in another place, Pride goeth before destruction, and the spirit is uplifted before a fall. And so let us, even from the words of the proud Pharisee, because of which he was humbled, take to ourselves that humility of soul, by means of which we shall be exalted. Just as he, dwelling on his own virtues, and upon the sins of those who were worse than him, exalted himself to his ruin, so we, having before our eyes our own sloth, but keeping before us all the virtues of those who are better than us, shall be humbled unto glory, in the measure that each one of us, bowed down and suppliant, prays thus within himself. O Almighty God, have mercy on me, thy suppliant, for I am not as thy innumerable servants, sublime in their contempt of the world, admirable in virtue, angelic in the glory of their chastity, as are also many of these who, after public offenses, merited by their repentance to come to love thee. And also, if I by the gift of thy grace have done anything of good, in what measure I have done it I know not, or what penalty may be weighed by thee in the scales against it I know not. In all this, let us take note that the Lord appearing among us in the flesh confirmed by his example whatever he taught us by the words of his mouth. For he who said to us, So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, also sought in all things that he began to do and to teach, not his own glory, but the glory of his Father, who with the Son and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth God forever. Amen.